Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I was going to do a lot of writing, so some of the stuff I'm just going to have to talk to you. All right? And I have a couple of things that I put on that I'll be able to project. And then at the end, I'll show you a little video, okay, from YouTube. You guys know YouTube? Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm the old guy. You guys know all that stuff. Um, and what I want to try and get across to you today is show you how your coursework that you're going to take fits into even this very simple project, this spud gun thing, okay? And my advice to you is have a lot of fun with the spud gun because it's an easy project, it's a lot of fun. It's not gonna involve a lot of hard analysis and mathematics and the stuff that you're gonna have to do later when you're designing who knows what in senior design and, and those other classes. So uh, try and have some fun with it. And um, you will see as I talk, or at least you probably would have seen more, how even the spud gun can be fairly complicated if you're trying to do things accurately. And the analysis that needs to go into that really spans a lot of our curriculum. All right? So let me start by just talking a little bit about how the spud gun works and what uh, goes on. And I think a lot of you know this already, but you're going to have a uh, <coughs> basically a two-chamber design. I don't know which, uh, which size you're using for which, but generally you do something like this about a four, five, six inch chamber, which you'll then hook up to a barrel. The dimensions should not be this way, all right? And in fact, I'll show you a couple of websites which will give you some optimal, at least what they think are optimal, uh, ratios of the volumes and the sizes for these two things. Those are the main components. What's gonna happen, and I think a lot of you know it, you're gonna stick a potato in one end and you're going to create an edge on this end so that the potato gets cut as it goes in and it fits nice and smooth. You're going to bring it down almost to this chamber. This will be the combustion chamber. In the combustion chamber, you're going to mix some fuel and air, just like happens in the engine of your car. And then you're going to give it a spark, just like happens in the engine of your car. And with that, the pressure and heat will build. It'll push the potato out send it as a projectile in the free motion, hopefully to hit your target. All righty, everybody got the basic idea? And there'll be details on how you actually construct these things later. By the way, we went to these because they're a lot safer than what we used to do. Prior to Barry's appearance, I used to teach aerodynamics and we had people building rockets with a little solid booster engines and we used to try and hit targets, but we got in a little bit of trouble for that. But I still have students from the 80s come back and say how much fun it was. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what goes on uh, with the thing going back to the, to the beginning, which is the combustion chamber. Um, and let's talk a little bit about what happens in there. We're going to mix fuel and air. Yeah? We're going to give it a spark. And what is that going to do? Muscles. Somebody say they... Combustion, and somebody else said an explosion, yeah? Combustion is really the proper term because it's actually just going to burn. It's going to burn through there. It's going to take a little bit of time. As part of the burn, what happens? It's a chemical reaction, yes? Oxygen and fuel. You guys took chemistry? Oxygen and fuel does what? It goes to, in the ideal, it goes to just carbon dioxide. All the carbon in the fuel becomes carbon dioxide, yes? All the hydrogen in the fuel becomes water, if you've done it right. And in the process, what happens? Releases heat, yeah? Now, I had a bunch of equations I was going to put up here that shows you, or at least illustrates for you, that depending on the fuel you have, you're going to want to put in just the proper amount of air. Anybody ever hear of the air-fuel ratio? Okay, in an automobile, that's very important. That's what the carburetor used to do, and now the uh, fuel injectors, make sure you have the proper air-fuel ratio. That's because if you have too much air, by the way, where does the heat come from? Where does the temperature rise come from? From which part, the air or the fuel? <coughs> which contains the energy that gets released, generally? Fuel. The fuel, all right? And in fact, all fuels have what we call a heating value. When you take thermo or if you take um, internal combustion engines, you'll have a lot of tables with heating values for various kinds of fuels. That's basically how much heat is released 
per kilogram or gram of the fuel that you burn. Does that make sense? All right, so what we'd like to do is burn as much fuel as we can. Well, when you open this thing up and put the fuel in there and then you close it, if it was completely filled with fuel, would it would have burned. No, because you have no oxygen, yes? So we can calculate for a fuel, if we know the chemical makeup, for instance, methane is CH4. You guys took chemistry, right? You know what that means? And if we burn that and we do the stoichiometric equation, ring a bell? Stoichiometric balance. What that tells us is that for every mole or molecule of methane, which would be one of the things that you might burn in here, you need two moles of oxygen. All right? Now, where do we find the oxygen? I just grab it, throw it in. Can I separate the oxygen from everything else in the air? No. So what I have to do is stuff this full of air and fuel. The key element, though, is the oxygen. Well, oxygen, does anybody know what air is made up of? Nitrogen. Hmm? nitrogen. Mostly nitrogen and a little bit of oxygen. The ratio is basically 21% is oxygen, about 78% is nitrogen, and 1% is all the rest of the stuff. So in general, when we model these things, we figure that for every mole of air, because that's what we have to work with, we're, we're not going to get, for every, I should say, for every mole of oxygen that we want, we actually have to put in 4.76 moles or molecules of air. All right? And if we want to burn, for instance, methane, oops, we want to put in, hey, look at there. In your mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. You know that part of the moles? Equation back. 